So how thoroughly did South Park eviscerate Meghan Markle. Hello everyone, welcome to Royal News Network. My name is Brittany. And today we are talking about South Park's worldwide privacy episode. Yes, they specifically target Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. There's bits about them with a bullhorn telling everyone, the entire world, how much they want their privacy. They're shooting off fireworks. Harry's playing polo in Colorado. And we also have this bit though that I think is incredibly profound about the impact of being obsessed with branding being a professional victim, and how really, at the end of the day, Meghan Markle is an empty vessel. South Park, although they take a lot of shots at Harry, who they really shred is Meghan. She is the main target. Her actions, her hypocrisy, everything I feel like really is driving towards them, towards her. She doesn't even talk that much in the episode, really. But who she is and this what she's created around Harry, that's what they're really targeting. And I actually feel like at the end, Harry comes out looking sort of good while Megan is portrayed as somebody who's obsessed essentially with money, her branding, everything, and less interested in what is happening to people, humanity, and the rest of the world, and even her husband. It's all about her. And South Park does this exceptionally well. The commentary here is not only is it fantastic, it's funny, it's spot on, but it's also, again, profound. I was like really shocked at the end. I was like, I was expecting something very crass and just basically joke after joke after joke. But really the, the commentary, the cultural commentary behind it is excellent. So we will go into that today. But if you guys haven't been here to Royal News Network before, like I said, my name is Brittany and on this channel I provide compelling royal commentary about the latest news and a little bit of gossip as well. I also will will review television shows and movies and share a bit about history as well. And I'm closing in on 100,000 subscribers. So please, if you haven't already, if you've enjoyed these videos, please go ahead and subscribe. I would love to hit 100K by March 6th, I think it is. That is the year anniversary of when I first slept uploaded a video. I had no clue how well this channel would do. And so I have been so profoundly blessed and just so excited that you have all have come on this journey with me. And I'll also have a couple links in the description box down below. I have a weekly newsletter, Royal Wire. I also have a trip coming up to London and the Cotswolds. So if you want to tour a bit of the UK with me, I'd love to have you. And I also have a fashion channel that I've said before is on a bit of a hiatus and I'm hoping to get it back up and running here really, really soon. But Harry and Meghan, oh, Harry and Meghan, they come under the laser focus of South Park. And South Park, if you don't know, it's a United States cartoon program, but a mature cartoon. And the animation is very basic. And that's the point. And, but it does a lot of cultural commentary and they really push the limits in a lot of ways. These are guys who are not pulling back from stabbing at basically anybody who are not afraid to attack essentially anybody if they have a point to make. Now, I haven't seen really any of South Park, but if even other episodes are like this one, there's actually some really good commentary and things behind it. I don't know if you're interested, hey, check it out and you might be pleasantly surprised as well. But without further ado, let's get into the episode. So it starts off very sweet. It looks like Kyle, he's the main, I don't know if he's the main character, but he's one of the main characters. And this episode pretty much entirely focuses on him. So he walks in and he's going to play a game with his friends on his computer and his little brother, I'm guessing it's his little brother because really I know nothing about the program, is sitting in front of the computer crying and rewatching the Queen's funeral. So go ahead and take a listen to this little bit here. Today is a tragic day for Canada. Thousands of Canadians have gathered to mourn the passing of their beloved mother. The Queen, is dead. Absolute emptiness right now. <laughs> and now the casket is brought down the aisle with the queen inside. The queen's body being carried by the royal guard. I can clean dark type with my friends! No, get up! So Kyle's really, really frustrated. And so then we have Harry and Meghan come in and they are immediately met with jeers from the crowd. So go ahead and take a listen here. Like the prince and his new wife have just shown up. The prince and his wife have, of course, been bashing the Canadian monarchy. A lot of Canadians hate them now. Oh, and I believe the Earl of Halifax has just spotted on the prince's wife's face. The prince seems to have taken offense to this. Oh, and this is bad now. <laughs> so I love the Earl of Halifax farting <laughs> in Megan's face. 
<laughs> I think that's so funny. And yes, yeah, so just to let you know as well, they call them the Prince of Canada and the wife. <laughs> they don't really even call her a princess. They call her the wife. And throughout the episode, they may mention princess here or there. And so I just love the bit about them being jeered and, you know, targeted by people in the crowd. I thought that was kind of great. Just because, again, we all wish we could see them do that, but the monarchy is just so classy when it comes to Harry and Meghan, and they really don't deserve it. Okay, so next day, Kyle goes to school, and he finds out his friends did play the game without him, and they didn't miss him, really. And I thought this was... And they may have not been doing this intentionally, but what I could see from it, a different layer is that, so Harry and Meghan have left, and yet they're complaining they're not part of things anymore. I thought it was kind of like Kyle in a way. It was a weird, like, symbiotic thing. And so I was like, huh, I wonder if they're picking up on that, that Harry and Meghan left, and that the monarchy's just moving on, and they're totally fine. They're totally fine. That doesn't contribute, that doesn't, that thread doesn't go through the entire episode, but I did enjoy that little bit, and I was like, Hmm, I could read into that a little bit. And so then once Kyle finds out that his friends dismissed him, basically, one of his other schoolmates, and again, I don't know if this character is around most of the time, he comes up to him and goes, hey, I, I, I saw what happened. And you know what you really need? You really need a brand to help yourself and everything. And then it almost immediately goes to the two people who are most well-known, I feel like, right now for trying to create a brand. And that's Harry and Meghan, and they go to Good Morning Canada. It has been several months now since our beloved Queen has died. Our Canadians are finding it hard to go on. Our Canadians, that is, except for our first guest, the Prince and his wife. <laughs> I love it how everybody else is finding it hard to go on, but Harry and Meghan. I feel like that's a great bit that they just even did right there. We want privacy! We want privacy! Huh, thanks for having us on the show! It's so awesome to be here, it's great. So, what I noticed about what they did with Megan is that they made her very much this valley girl type of voice a little bit, and they just made her sound, I think, rather dim in a way. They really didn't try to portray her as, I'm sure she wants to be seen as, this great intellectual, this powerhouse of thinking, this great philanthropist. They really didn't portray her that way at all. And again, you gotta love the signs, we want our privacy, we want our privacy, and yet they're going on a television show. Now, I will say, and again, this is because Harry and Meghan's PR is terrible, is that Harry and Meghan tried, tried to backtrack this idea of privacy. They recently tried to do that, I believe around the time their reality TV show was released. They tried to go, oh no, 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 we never wanted privacy, we never wanted privacy. It was very much like what happened with the racist comments that Harry said he didn't make and it was, all, that Meghan didn't make and it was all the British media. He backtracked on that with his interview with Tom Bradby. The problem is, is that Harry let that sit for two years, much like the whole privacy thing. Here Harry and Meghan let that sit for two years and then complain and go, no, 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 it was never about privacy and it was never about privacy. But that narrative, guys, has been spinning for two years. The time to address the narrative that you don't like is immediately rather than letting it perpetuate. So I think this idea that they didn't want, pri that they really wanted privacy was always ridiculous. Meghan has always wanted fame and fortune. However, they've always railed against, well, the media is invading our privacy. We want to keep the privacy for our son Archie, yada, yada, yada. It's all about privacy, 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 but oh, we don't really want privacy. And that kind of hypocrisy and that inability to provide a good sound message is just always coming back to bite Harry and Meghan in the butt because they just think, I think for some reason that the world should just agree with what they're thinking or just grovel at their feet. I just don't really understand it personally. I don't get it. And this and again is another instance of Harry and Meghan being just really profoundly bad at their own PR. And it's reflected here, and I think it's good. So let me start with you, Sam. You've lived a life with the royal family, you've had everything handed to you, but you say your life has been hard, and now you've written all about it in your new book, Wah. <laughs> I love how they call his book Wah. It's so good. It's so good because that was, that's what it is. It was a gigantic wine session. He just whined, 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 whined about being a prince in a literal castle. Yes, that's right, friend. You see, my wife and I, I are totally like, you should write a book because your family's like stupid and then so are like journalists. So I love how they have Megan interrupting Harry. Because again, we've seen this time and time again with Megan interrupting Harry. Megan trying to drive the conversation. So I thought that was really, really fantastic. So you hate journalists. That's right. And now you wrote a book that reports on the lives of the royal family. Right. 
So you're a journalist. We just want to be normal people. All this attention is so hard. And again, South Park is great about picking up on the hypocrisy. So you hate journals and you hate people sh sharing your secrets, yet you're perfectly fine sh sharing secrets about the royal family themselves. Again, Harry could have written a book about his philanthropic endeavors and how his time in the military and his own mental health struggles really did impact him going on and doing what he's doing now. However, he doesn't do that. He complains about his family, his lot in life. He says basically his father was a bad dad and he calls out his brother for being bald. Like he was kind of terrible and ratty in the book. Isn't it true, sir, that your questionable wife has her own TV show and hangs out with celebrities and does fashion magazines? <laughs> I love how he calls them her, his questionable wife. Again, I feel like South Park's true target here is Megan. They shred her throughout this. I mean, it gets even better. But I was just surprised that even though Harry takes, I feel like, more of a center stage here, their real target is Megan. What are you suggesting? Well, I just think some people might say that your Instagram-loving bitch wife actually doesn't want her privacy. How dare you, sir? My Instagram-loving bitch wife has always wanted her privacy. And you know what else? To hell with Canada. We are leaving. Ooh, the Instagram loving wife bit. Oh, that was that was really good. Because Megan is obsessed with Instagram, I feel like. And again, I've said this before based on her reality TV show. Megan is obsessed with the Instagram veneer of things. She wants this veneer of perfection. And she wants, which is how what people do on Instagram. They curate a perfected look at their lives. People do it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter all sorts of social media, YouTube and everything. And so I really feel like she is obsessed with Instagram. I'm sure it kills her that she's not on Instagram right now. They say they're not obsessed with social media, but they are. And she is obsessed with fame and fortune and being on magazine covers and all these sorts of things. And yet at the same time, they're screaming and railing about their privacy and that people can't talk about them unless they give them permission. They only speak with certain journalists. And again, South Park is just completely on top of them and just throwing up a mirror in their face. We'll go find some quiet place where we can be normal people. Come on, wife. We want privacy. We, we want privacy. So we want privacy. We want privacy. Yeah, look at us, look at us, look at us. And then there's a whole theme song about it. It's awesome. <laughs> So they finally arrive in South Park, where they proceed, where they proceed to take up a four section of a street and then walk around with their signs saying, "We want privacy. We want privacy." Okay, so then now we get back to the whole branding storyline, which I, they, it all connects actually really well. So they're back at this branding thing. So this is Kyle and his friend, and this branding guy is trying to help him. And I'll leave you to your own imagination of why they named it Come Hammer. That, that is the name of the branding location. So what they do here, which I think is really great, is they show different brands that Kyle can have. So the first one is Rugged Vegan Compassionate Victim. Next one is Sensitive Outdoorsy Frugal Victim. The next one is Wealthy, Handsome, Multi-Talented, Grammy Award Winning Victim. What they're sharing here is that sometimes these brands are all about being a victim of something. And I, I thought that was incredible because every single time I knew it would end with victim. And that's what Harry and Meghan pretend to be, is these victims of their circumstances, of their lives, of their time in the royal family of palaces. I mean, come on, guys. You are not real victims here. Life is tough. Get a helmet. So Harry and Meghan have decided that South Park will be their home. Oh, darling, I think this might be the place. You really think so? It's so quiet and empty here. If we moved here, then people would think we're really serious about wanting to be normal. 
<laughs> I love that bit where Megan's character is like, well, I think people would really think we want to be normal because they live in a small town. It's like, yep, yep. If they really wanted to even try to do that in real life, they would actually have lived in a normal place instead of Montecito, California. Literally the most expensive zip code they could possibly think of. Although now that most of those have been relocated to Florida, so I just think that's kind of funny. And Hollywood people hate Florida. I don't understand why. It does seem perfect, doesn't it? We can have a fresh start here. Lead a normal life and have babies. Can we? Can we rally him up here and finally have our own privacy? My love, I will do anything for your privacy. I love it, my love. Because again, they're picking up on that, my love, my darling, all these sorts of like cheesy nicknames Harry and Meghan have for each other. I just thought that they picked that up. And again, it was really good. It's like, and she keeps saying he wants normal. And she goes, I want privacy. And again, privacy is code for, I want to be as famous as humanly possible and have nobody look into anything that I say or do. That's what privacy really means to Meghan Markle, I feel like. And so they buy their house and they show up in their private jet in the driveway and they're immediately taking things into their home. One of the things is a drum set and poor Kyle, he has to watch Prince Harry play the drums. What the hell? Hey, hey you, hey, what are you looking at? You ever heard of privacy? So what they do here I thought was really great is that Harry is making noise. He's drawing attention to himself. And then he's yelling at Kyle for noticing he's playing the drums and ca calling attention to himself. I feel like that's an incredible bit there. That's an, such an incredible bit. Just to say that, hey, Harry and Meghan rail and call for privacy, that they want their private lives to be protected and yada, yada, yada. Yet they are also drawing enormous attention to themselves and then complaining that people notice them. It's like, well, what do you want? You can't have it both ways. And so then Harry and Meghan, they have a fireworks display at their home in the middle of the night. I love it. And they even have different different slogans for their little their little shots that they take about we want our privacy. It's, it's rather funny. We are here because privacy is a basic human right. How many more princes and his wives have to live in this nightmare? And so every playing polo is hilarious. And then again, we have this reinforcing of this notion that Harry and Meghan get angry at people for noticing them. So watch this. Hey, can you two keep it down? Hey, you ever heard of a thing called privacy? Yeah, nobody gives you. You two just shut up and go away. Okay, so Harry hits his polo ball into Kyle's house. And then Kyle yells at him. And Harry's like, what are you doing? And so it's like, well, you knocked the window in. Why do you expect people not to look? Again, it's this whole idea of Harry railing against the monarchy and then on not understanding why they don't want to reconcile with him. It's like, because you railed against them. This is not a difficult concept. This is not a difficult concept at all. All oh, you made a fuss against them, made them look bad, and then you're complaining that they don't want to talk to you, that they're not going to have this grand summit that you want them to have. Like, of course they're not going to do that with you. And so now we go back again to the branding thing, and I love what the branding guy comes up with for Kyle. So watch this. Okay, I think we got it. People are going to love this. Kyle, he's a thick skin, super cool, nothing bothers him. Victim. Again, victim. The victim part of the branding. I think... It, Oh gosh, it's so good. I was, again, really surprised about the level of detail here and the broader conversation we're having about people who portray themselves as victims, which the owners and creators of South Park are definitely not. They got a six year deal with Paramount Plus and you know how much it was for? Almost a billion dollars. Those guys are swimming in the dough because they created some unique original content that's not afraid to poke at the culture, not afraid to be profound, not afraid of cancel culture at all. That's what South Park is and that's why they're rolling in the dough and I don't think Harry and Meghan ever will. South Park is a billion dollar brand. Harry and Meghan are not. So I love it. So they have this long montage of, of Kyle getting off the bus. It's this very melancholy music and all of a sudden it gets all tense and everything. I mean, 
it's almost horror music of seeing all the pictures of Meghan Markle. Now, one of them is funnily is actually Catherine and her Vogue cover, but the rest of them are Meghan. And some of them say fabulous making her mark. One says, OMG, just see, look, seriously, look. Uh, there's a People magazine cover with Megan's head really big and Harry's head really small. And then a Vanity Fair, what the princess wants. And then it says Lucky Life 2. What would she do? The feminist issue of weekday, the princess of something. And then we're obsessed talking about Megan and CQ hype. So again, all these things poking fun at Megan. And Harry and Megan, of course, are creepily looking. Did they notice that they plastered pictures of Megan all over his front door? And then he ignores them. Because again, he's trying to recreate his brand, so he ignores them. I don't care. Don't care. Oh, what did he just say? He victimized me. It's because I'm an ethnic woman. He can't do that. I'll see. Wait, you're ethnic? This is an outrage. We'll just see how he deals with my blue penis. So, Megan just calls victimization about anything. So, Kyle literally ignored her, and that's victimizing her. Oh, I was like, it's so good. Is it not so good? I just thought that was an incredible bit because again, Harry and Meghan, you feel like, and it is frustrating. There's this whole bit I didn't include because it was part of the clips where basically it was saying, Kyle was like, I can't get away from it. They're around all the time. And it's like, yes. And it's like, you do become a little obsessed, but then Harry and Meghan wants you to look at them and then they get mad that you look at them. And so I think that part of the, the commentary is spot on. They don't want you to look and yet they want you to look. Don't look yet, look, please look. We're obsessed with you looking. So Kyle, once again, is ignoring Harry. Now I will put a block over this because I feel like it's a little inappropriate and I missed it at first, is that Harry really does use his blue penis to try to get Kyle to pay attention to him. He rubs it technically all over the window. <laughs> And then Harry comes back, Megan looks at him forlornly, and he's like, no, he did not pay attention to us. And you gotta love all the pictures of Harry and Meghan on the wall. All of them looking all very royal from their wedding day and everything. Again, showing the self-obsession we all know Harry and Meghan have with each other and themselves. <laughs> Don't worry, my love. He's not gonna get away with this. <laughs> Again, I mean, you almost feel like... I almost feel like we should do what South Park says, which is ignore Meghan Markle, because that's what she really wants, for people to ignore her. In a way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it doesn't totally, but it does. The most important thing about your brand is being flexible. We want to make sure you're completely satisfied. You say you're having some problems? That's right! There's this horrible spy who lives across the street from us, and we're gonna get him back by changing our brand. So, Ari and Megan, now they are using Come Hammer. They are going to the branding professionals. And as we find out, Megan maybe already had an association here. All right, and I do see you're in our database, but you didn't first get help at this Come Hammer location? No, my wife went to one in California as a child. Ah, okay, then you must be in the national system. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, is this you? Sorority girl, actress, influencer, victim. Yeah, that's totally me. I love how they're, the whole list of her profile for this branding thing does not mention royalty at all. It's socialite, actress, influencer, victim. Because that's what she is. And you could even say now that that is the progression of her life. Sorority girl, actress, influencer, victim. Because she is a professional victim. That's what she's decided her branding is going to be, is her talking about her victimhood, that she's been the victim of racism, sexism, so many different things. Yet at the same time, she literally had a wedding that cost millions upon millions of dollars. She lived in a literal castle for a period of time, a palace technically, and she has a her grandmother, now her father-in-law, is the king of freaking England. So what are you complaining about? What is your victim status? I don't see it. So things didn't go your way and that makes you a victim? Absolutely not. Okay, I see. And then you added your husband to your friends and family account. You must be the royal prince millionaire world traveler victim. That's right. Give me a minute. I'm with some other clients right now. Yeah. Uh, no, this is an emergency. We need to talk to you. Uh, do you mind? Stop and beta. Oh, it's him. Ah! <laughs> so Harry and Megan's freak out about this kid who just lives across the street and just happens to notice them when they're being obnoxious. <laughs> 
Again, this whole realization, this whole thing that Harry and Meghan have is that they want attention and then get upset when they get attention. Specifically the attention they don't want. That's key here. You just can't leave us alone, can you? Oh my God, he's so obsessed with us. I'm not obsessed with you. Don't you see, Butters? Teaching people to think of their brand just makes more people like them. So I love this, that all of a sudden we get this kind of dramatic music and then the music I feel like we would hear on maybe an 80s or 90s sitcom when they're trying to teach the audience a lesson. And there is a great lesson here. When you are only solely focused on brand building, if you add nothing to the conversation, if you add nothing to basically the, the broader public and cultural zeitgeist, you be just become just you become like Harry and Meghan, people who whine, complain, have this great platform, yet do absolutely nothing worthwhile with it. And at the same time, get mad at people for noticing them when they're trying to get people to notice them. It only seems to, they only seem to care about people noticing them on their terms and nothing else. But when you are part of the cultural landscape, if you are a public person, hey, there'll be a general interest in your public life. And Harry and Meghan have the made the mistake, the critical error of very much making making their private life public. And so the public feels like they have the right to ask for more from you. That's why couples like, for example, um, Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds, they are public, yet they keep so much of their lives private. All their children's names, like it took us forever to figure out what their third daughter's name was. And then we also have, they had a fourth child and we don't know if it's a boy or a girl. And they do show themselves from time to time in their home, in their personal lives. But yet very, very much, they still have this distance from the public. It's very much like the Kardashians. If you invite the public in, you can't just then throw them out when it's not convenient for you. Because once you let people in, they feel like they have a right to you. And that's what I don't think Harry and Meghan have fully understood. This whole thing is wrong. They're telling you guys to reduce yourself into products instead of people to be truly understood and loved. Products instead of people. That's critical. Megan is all about the vain, vapid aspect of being an influencer. She wants to be a product, a brand. She wants to be something that constantly generates money. But yet at the same time, she's a brand, quote unquote, but not really a person anymore. She's not really something where she's actually, people value her for her additions to society, for her acting, for her producing, for her directing. She doesn't do any of those things. And so what are we supposed to exactly hang on to? And that's why it becomes more about building the brand than your actual person. And unfortunately, Megan's, I and Harry maybe, hopefully they're taking some notes from this, maybe perhaps realizing that building the brand means very little if your personhood gets lost in the process. Don't you guys want people to like you for you instead of who they want you to be? That's such a critical message. Have people like you for you and not this brand you're trying to curate. That's what Mary, Harry and Meghan are doing all the time. Meghan gives us always a facade. It's chameleon facade, one that she changes when it's convenient for her. But what it means is that people cannot attach to you because they don't know who you really are. You're obsessed more with the brand than your personhood. And ergo, it's harder for people to attach to you because they really don't know who you are because it's all about Brand Sussex and Harry and Meghan and having these certain images. She wants this curated Instagram veneer of things. And unfortunately, what that means is that people, you're not showing the people the real you. I don't know who the real Megan is. No clue who the real Megan is. I feel like she changes herself constantly depending on the situation. I have no idea who she really is. None in the slightest. And I think that is a huge issue for Megan. She needs to stop trying to play and create a brand that she feels like will endear herself to the public. She just needs to be herself. But that's the hardest thing. When you're a narcissist and you're also somebody who thrives on misinformation and acting, maybe? Look, we all have our faults. God knows I do. But if we just try to present and control an image of us for people to see them, we're just performers instead of human beings. Love that. We are performers. And that's, again, Megan. Megan is constantly giving us a performance. Do you know how we know that? She smiles all the time, even in situations where it doesn't make sense for her to smile. She's just grinning. She's always grinning. 
grinning like this, grinning like this. They're being shown their, their third row seats or second row seats at St. Paul's service when they have to have Eugenie and Beatrice move. And she's just like this. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. <laughs> that bothers me so much because I know it's a mask. I know there has to be something else going on there. You grinning like an idiot tells me that this is a facade. It's a mask. It's not your real you because you're not showing me an actual emotion given the situation. Now, I'm not expecting her to throw temper tantrum. I'm not expecting anything like that, but a frown, a contemplative expression, something where you can just tell in her face that this is bothering her. No, no, no. It's just grin. Just grin, grin, grin. No matter what is happening, we're smiling. We're grinning. It's fake. It's so fake. I can appreciate that most of the time, especially royals, I understand if you're a celebrity, maybe that's somewhat your job, but even celebrities show genuine expression on the red carpet. But royals especially, they are people who got their position based on their usually their birth or who they married. So their expression changes. Catherine is not always smiling or her smile drops or she has, she, she smells like this or like this or you know her expression changes and so I feel like she's a real person in a lot of ways Megan I don't feel like that's real because the plastered on endless smile it's hard even to find a picture of her not smiling because I've tried with things and it just irritates the heck out of me because I know it's fake and it's just seems ridiculous to me that she cannot understand that you need to stop putting on an act for us. Stop acting. Just try to be a real person. He's right. Trying to make ourselves into a brand just turned us into products. We don't need to be a brand, do we? And it's so sweet that Harry recognizes it in this episode. He recognizes it. And I hope one day for Harry's sake, he'll understand what Megan did. So unfortunately, what we're seeing with Harry right now so, so often is that he just says, well... Everybody says this is Megan. It wasn't Megan. It was my decision. We, we we did this together. Everybody blames Megan. It wasn't Megan. It wasn't Megan. It wasn't Megan at all. We did this together or I did it myself. And it's like, Harry, we all know, bud. We all know this wasn't really totally your idea. Because if Harry had this his way, he'd be living in Africa somehow. He'd be doing something entirely different, I feel like, than what he's trying to do. I've never, ever heard Harry talk about being a producer, being somebody who's a maker and shaker in Hollywood. And I'm sure we all, to a certain extent, have our, our strange Hollywood dreams, you know, of being an actor or a singer or something like that. But I've never heard Harry mention any of these things. And so this idea that all of a sudden he's going to California and this was all his idea and all he wanted, like, no, this was Megan's dream. Megan wanted to live in Montecito. Megan wanted to go back to Hollywood. Megan, this is Megan's town. This is Megan, 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 Harry. You're just, it, that he keeps trying to push that, no, this was, was totally his idea. I'm like, Harry, we all know really what's going on here. It's, it seems to be only you that doesn't. If it's truly what we want, then we really can get away from it all. No more magazines and Netflix shows. We really can live a normal life. So I love that he's <laughs> like, no more magazines, no more Netflix shows. Yes, Harry. Yes, yes, yes. You guys don't have to do that. And this idea that they could do everything they wanted to do via Mexit without any consequences and that they could live this weird life they're seeming to live, I just always found so odd because wouldn't you much rather, Harry, be in Africa, being a tour guide, doing those sorts of things? He's so much more comfortable in Africa. Why is he in California? I know it's beautiful. I know it's lovely. I know the weather is insane. But at the same time, this is Megan's dream. This is Megan's life. This is what Megan has wanted. We all know this. And so I think it would be fantastic for Harry to realize that you don't have to live the way you and Megan live right now. You don't have to live it so publicly if you don't want to. And you could still do great work. You could live in Canada. You could have lived in Northern California, San Diego, somewhere that's not so screams, I'm desperate for Hollywood. Montecito screams, I'm desperate for Hollywood's validation. Now this next little bit, I won't show you yet because I feel like it's best for at the end, but we're gonna continue on here. And Kyle, his little brother, is once again watching the Queen's funeral. And I love how he reacts the second time. So go ahead and take a watch. I, I need to use it. Oh no, not again. She's still dead. Ike. I have to get on with my friends. If I don't, they're gonna think I'm... It's okay. 
things get to you. It's who you are. I think that's so sweet. I really do. Things get to you. That's that's who you are. I just, oh, I'm like, aw. I love that. I just, I was not expecting that from South Park of all things. And so next little bit we get Kyle once again and his friends have come by and they want to have him come out and play. Oh, hey guys. Hey, dude, uh, we thought maybe you could do a little outside time. Really? We just thought it'd be good to get you out of the house. You seem to be going through a lot lately. I think, again, it's just such a touching way to end the episode and not what I was expecting at all. It's just so sweet and just goes to show, you know, if you have see somebody who's having a tough time, yes, maybe you don't totally understand the royals and somebody's frustration about it, but hey, maybe they need to go out and get a pedicure or manicure. Maybe they just need to take a walk. You know, reach out to people who seem to be having a little bit of a tough time at the moment. I feel like that's a great lesson here. And then they go out and play some basketball and they have a fun addition who shows up. Uh, could, uh, could I play? Sure, you can play. Good. <laughs> and Harry plays the drums. That's awesome. I la absolutely love it. The direction this show went was a complete surprise to me. I, I've never watched South Park before. I was hoping it was gonna be, I was thinking it was gonna be super crass and crude and yes, there's some language and everything, but I really thought that this message at the end was profound. And I think it puts Harry in a rather good light here at the end saying, yes, he's kind of a, a doof and yes, he needs obviously some serious help. But at the same time, you can also say, hey, you know, there's just something going on in his life right now and maybe he needs a little bit of support. But let me go back to the bit before because I think the way they show Megan really cements for me that this wasn't totally a teardown of Harry, but a indictment on who Megan is and what Megan is trying to do. And they really have some great insights into our character, I think. Yes, I'm sure you agree, darling. We can be the people we talked about being with no more worries about how we look or the image we project to people. This idea that there is, we can be the people we actually want to be, the people we actually say we want to be, that's huge. I think that's huge because Harry and Meghan tell us all the time how great they are, how philanthropic they are, how wonderful they are, how they can really help people and yada, yada, yada. But I don't feel like we see that really. At the end of the day, I don't, I don't feel it from Harry and Meghan because they're saying it and they're not doing it. They could lead a different life if they wanted to. They could lead a life where they don't pat themselves on the back for giving people a hundred dollar basket of donuts, or not donuts, and bagels. They could do that, but they've decided to go upon this very self-congratulatory route for doing so very little. And I think it's clear that there, there's so many, such deeper things that could happen, but Harry and Meghan, and I think particularly Meghan, She's an exceptionally shallow person, which South Park very much picks up on. What matters is what we have on the inside. Hello? Now you may have caught my little laugh there in the, in the video, which I don't mind. <laughs> Which I felt a little bad because I had to film it because you can't usually film something from Hulu or HBO Max or some of these stations like directly from your screen like you can in some other situations. So when I saw that and I'm like empty, pulling back the head, yelling and go, hello, and it echoes and I'm like, you so get Meghan Markle, South Park. You so get her. She is empty word salad. That's what she is. She is vain, vapid, shallow. That's who she actually is. But she masks it all by trying to seem very deep. I read The Economist. And when she went one time to an event, a suits event in Texas, she even had The Economist like under her arm as she was walking out the airport knowing the, the paparazzi were following her. See, look, I'm smart. I'm smart. But I haven't 
seen any evidence really that Megan is as bright as she thinks she is. Number one, she could not strategize to save her life. There's so many things her and Harry could have done differently that would have made their entire situation turn out 110 times better than it currently is. She is responsible for the cluster messiness that is their lives. She is responsible for it. Harry's too dim. To be quite honest, Harry's too dead. This is her. She has machinations that she wants to do all these things, yet she cannot think through logically the issues that might come up, how she can address certain things. No, it's just all this dumpster fire of everything. And of course, nothing works out the way she thinks it does or thinks it will. And so then she has to adjust constantly. And she's not good at that either. Because again, if you were smart, if you're in a royal system, you want to... If she and Harry wanted to leave, she should have lasted at least five years. She couldn't even last two. You need to last at least five, honey, because then you can maybe get out and have a better exit strategy. Or even if it was the 18 months, you needed to have a better exit strategy than dropping the bomb on the family and thinking because you are the superstar that they're just going to go and follow all your demands. You put it on a website, ergo, it is gold. And the monarchy's like, no, we're, we're not following that. And the monarchy always had all the power in this situation. The monarchy always held all the cards. Harry and Meghan had nothing. They gave away their leverage. <laughs> and then they wonder why things didn't work. It's so easy to see why they didn't work. And once again, Meghan, she, she follows all, the, all of these causes constantly. And so she follows the Uvalde thing and then it's on parental leave. And so they just seem to jump bandwagons whenever it's convenient for her and Harry, not having a particular goal. And Meghan, if you listen to her podcast, Archetypes, she is very, A, bad at interviewing. She's a terrible interviewer. And B, she just can't seem to think beyond herself at all. She's very much, I think, and I have no clinical diagnosis of it, she very much seems like a narcissist, a, an absolute true narcissist. And so she, I think, struggles to adapt and struggles to connect with people in a lot of ways. Yes, she can charm the bejesus out of you, but most people see through it after a little bit. Harry's just the only dullard who can't. And maybe perhaps it's dawning on him a bit, but that emptiness, that emptiness, that South Park immortalized there is so clearly Megan. She is an empty shell. She is all flash and she's all money and she's all X, Y, and Z. But who she really is, we don't know because she's a chameleon. She changes when it's convenient. She's willing to drop anyone if they step out of line, whatever she thinks. And at the same time, she, she says all these things and it all sounds very good, but when you really think about the words, there's nothing really there. She's all about talk and no action. She's all about flash and no substance. That is who Meghan Markle is. And South Park picked up on it. South Park immortalized the talentless hack that is Meghan Markle. Harry actually, I think, once again, comes across as actually a bit sympathetic here. And what they highlighted as well, and I, I've said this before, is that Harry is desperate for people to think that this was not, that this was his idea to go to California, to do Mexico, everything, that this was all his idea, that it was, he, he made the decision together with Megan. This wasn't her idea, but Harry, we all know it's her idea. At the end of the day, we all know that. You're just the only one who doesn't think so. And Harry's paranoia and delusion keeps him in this bubble. And the tough thing is, if he admits he was swindled by Meghan Markle, that's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough to walk back from because you'll have to admit to your family and the rest of the world that you screwed up in a massive, massive way. And that's gonna take you a bit to come to terms with. But I think South Park gave Harry some, hopefully some good inspiration and some f good food for thought because it was actually surprisingly very good. Now I've heard that you can find it if you wanna watch it for yourself, at least in the States, you can pay for the live Hulu access 
or, or it will probably be on HBO Max sometime in the near future. I just looked because somebody said it was on HBO Max. I just looked, it's not actually. So the only place you can find it right now is on Hulu with the live edition, which is a little pricey. If not, it should come to HBO Max pretty soon because they had the first episode of the season. So I think the second one will come pretty quickly after this, maybe after a week or so. I'm not sure exactly how it works. So anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to check it out, of course, you are free to do so. And it was pretty crazy. And again, very, very insightful. So guys, again, thank you for watching. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.